Welcome everybody to this very special lecture on Old Frisian. I'm very pleased, since Old Frisian is close to my heart, I'm very in, uh, pleased to introduce the speaker, Orna Popkema. Can you stand up, Orna? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and he's my colleague from the University of Groningen. He teaches Old Frisian there. <coughs> He also has written a dictionary on Old Frisian. I'll just show it now. Sorry, I have to walk away. <laughs> this is the dictionary. <laughs> so uh, you're very welcome to have a look at the dictionary uh, after the lecture. Uh, so this is the Old Frisian, Old uh, Frisisches Handwörterbuch. And we are very pleased that we have that because when I studied old Frisian, myself, I had to use this one. Um, this is to Tolkien's copy, actually, of the old Frisian dictionary, and it's a dictionary uh, dating back to 1840. This is what it looks like. In Friesland we have several copies, so I could always borrow one, uh, one of those copies. Um, am I doing okay? No, no, I'm okay. <laughs> I just I thought you might want to... Yeah, thank you, thing. thank you. Then, then I don't have to run away. Good, thank you. So later on, feel free to come to the books <laughs> and uh, have a look uh, at them. Now, Arne Popkema also has made a marvellous description of a collection of old Friesian manuscripts in the Richthofen collection uh, in the Friesian library uh, Tresor. There are in total 10 manuscripts in the Richthofen collection. There's a beautiful website, richthofen.nl, and I think Arne will refer to that. Uh, and all those manuscripts have now been digitized. So that means when Arne and I are going to have our third edition of the Old Friesian Summer School next July, uh, we do have access to digitized versions of the Old Friesian <coughs> manuscripts. I think I'll leave it at this and I would welcome Orne Popkema to start speaking. Thank you, Johanneke. Thank you all for coming, by the way. Uh, let's see, about 30 or 40. That's much more than I ever had in a classroom, so uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I will speak to you, and I can just press on the, okay, I will speak to you about Old Frisian, a hidden gem of old Germanic studies. Um, giving away, of course, what my opinion is, but uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, what I will be talking to you about is when was Old Frisian spoken? Where was it spoken geographically? Uh, what is it? What do we have today? Uh, how can you study it? Very important, of course, but most importantly, why should you study it? I will hope to show that all of, all of that to you. And ending with a, a small note on the Old Frisian Summer School, which Johanneke just mentioned, uh, hoping I will see all of you back uh, next July here in, here in Oxford. We'll get to that later. But before starting with, with Old Frisian, we should say a few words about Frisian in general. Uh, it's Johanneke's mother tongue. It is my own as well, so also close to my heart. So please bear with me as I uh, tell a little bit about what it is today. Now, Friesland is a province in the, in the Netherlands. It's up in the north. It has about 650,000 inhabitants, uh, of which about 400,000 are speakers of the West Frisian language, which is about 65%. And uh, they're all bilingual. So not all inhabitants of Friesland are bilingual, but the Frisian speakers are. They all speak Dutch as a native language, as well as Frisian. So there are no monolingual Frisian speakers, or if they are, well, they're probably very old and very remote and isolated. Um, Frisian is a co-official language in the Netherlands, which is very important because that uh, ensures that we have a certain status so we can uh, use Frisian in education, in court, in media, everywhere in public life. And we can do that because it has been protected under the European Charter, uh, which was uh, drafted in 1992 the European Charter on Regional and Minority Languages. And Frisian is in there, and that's why we have as a minority language quite some, uh, uh, some um, uh, use of it in, in public life. But it's mainly a spoken language. It's not very much a written language. Okay, now uh, Frisian is also a language family. So it's not just West Frisian, which is the dialect I speak and which Johanneke speaks, 
There are three members in this language family today. There's West Frisian, as I explained, which, with, which has about 400,000 speakers. Then there's Sater Frisian, which you will see uh, at uh, Silterland, at the bottom uh, part on the right-hand side. Kreis of Saterland, which has only about 900 speakers, so it's very endangered. And then there's, there's North Frisian, also in Germany, up in the corner, uh, North Freshland, you can see it over there, which has about 9,000 speakers. So those are three linguistic aisles, one could say, of the, uh, of the Frisian language family. And then there was South Frisian, which was in the westernmost part of the Netherlands, the, the striped area where Amsterdam lies. Um, it is extinct now, but up until the 18th th uh, century, we, uh, we will have had speakers of that dialect of Frisian. We have small evidences of, of that. Um, and there's a lot of onomastics today, uh, which, which really uh, prove that uh, it was once a Frisian-speaking area over there. So, Old Frisian. When was Old Frisian spoken? In the past, of course, but how far back in the past? Um, you see here a branch of West Germanic, uh, at, uh, closely after uh, 200 AD, branching into Inguianic or North Sea Germanic, of course also English and Saxon, but also Frisian. Those are the three North Sea Germanic languages. Uh, branching from that is Proto or Common Frisian about halfway the first mille millennium, and then we can say, okay, there is a Frisian language. Um, Frisian then branches into different dialects, as any language would. Uh, we have Old South and Old West Frisian on the one hand and Old East Frisian on the other hand, further dividing into sub-dialects. You can see for yourself how that works and how at the bottom we would have Old West Frisian, Old Ems East Frisian and Old East Weser Frisian. Ems and Weser being the rivers uh, at the borders of which these Frisians would uh, use their dialects. And no written records, as I uh, said, from Old South Frisian. So we have no texts from that area. <coughs> um, if we take a look at history and language, dividing history up in, in, in nice bits, uh, we would start with the Romans, who up until about 300 AD were in the coastal area of the Netherlands. And there they met a tribe called the Frisii. Now the Frisii were an Indo-European tribe, and we know of them because... Uh, several uh, 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 writers of chronicles like Tacit and Pliny, uh, they mentioned the Frisii, but they were presumably non-Germanic, and we know that because we have a few names in those annals that are non-Germanic. You can see, you can tell from the name that they are not Germanic, but they were obviously leaders of the Frisians. Then when the Romans withdraw, there is a gap in history, in the inhabitation history. There, we do not have, we hardly have any archaeological evidence and no uh, real uh, written sources from the period between about 300 and 450. So they're gone. I will explain later why. And then we have an era, an era in which kings uh, emerge, Frisian kings, starting about in the, in the 5th century up until uh, about 700. And they, uh, in, in the written sources of that time, the Latin sources, the Frisians are referred to as the Frisones or the Frisones. We have onomastic evidence from that period. We have runes, we have individual Frisian words and Latin texts. So there really is a Frisian language, a Germanic language then, and we can trace it all back to nowadays. So there's a, a continuous line from then, from those Frisones to modern day Frisians. Uh, after the period of the kings come the Franks. Uh, they are expanding their area northward over the Rhine, uh, driving back the Frisians up, uh, up in the north. Um, and this is the period in which the Frisians have oral law, uh, old Germanic oral law, and they are part of the feudal system which the Franks bring with them. Um, but soon we see that the Franks, with their feudal system, with the counts and the kings and the dukes and what have you, they use to impose the feudal system, we see that the influence in the Frisian area declines. They're up in the, oh, I don't have a map yet, they're up in the marshes, behind the marshes, hardly penetrable, hardly reachable, so law cannot be administered by the feudal lords, taxes cannot be uh, collected. The Frisians more or less easily or uh, gradually become independent. And this is a state they more or less reach from about 1100 onwards until the end of the Middle Ages. So in the late Middle Ages, the Frisians are independent, which is very unique on the Frisian mainland. Not here, of course, 
but in the uh, Holy Roman Empire, everybody was part of the Holy Roman Empire. But the Frisians were not. They were reichsunmittelbar, meaning that they only answered to the emperor himself, and only in theory. The emperor had nothing to do with the Frisians. The Frisians had nothing to do with the emperor. And this is key for the understanding the, the medieval Frisian law texts, because they did have a need for written law, uh, also be, because you need law, but also because they needed some sort of ideological tool to express to the outside world and also to themselves, we are free because we have our own laws. You can see how that works. Um, also very uh, interesting is that where everywhere else law was written down in Latin, it was not by the Frisians. They had no need to write down their laws in Latin because they did not need to send copies over to the, to the king or to the emperor for him to understand Frisian law. They had no relation whatsoever. So they just wrote down their oral law in their own language, Frisian, and copied that. Of course, we have Latin translations, but those are translations of Frisian law, not vice versa. This is very important. So after the Middle Ages, the Frisians are conquered, one could say, by a, by a lord, a, a, a warlord from outside, from Saxony, uh, and that was the end of the Frisian independence, uh, the start of the Frisian be, prisons being incorporated into the Dutch Republic and the nation state of today, leading to Dutchification of the language. Frisian nowadays is very much Dutchified. It is most definitely a separate Germanic tongue and most definitely also very uh, distinguishable as such, but you can see that the influence of Dutch has really uh, 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 progressed since, uh, since the 16th century. Okay, so summarizing, we have the Roman area up until 300, a small gap, then comes the era of the kings for about three centuries, followed by the comital era when the Frisians are part of the feudal system uh, imposed by the Franks. Uh, they uh, withdraw from that and then uh, starts the era of Frisian freedom, uh, and afterwards, when that's done, the province, uh, it's a province of the Dutch Republic. And the area of the Frisian freedom is the period in which all old Frisian is written down. This is important to remember. Okay. Now, where was old Frisian spoken? We know when it was uh, used, but where was it used? We need some maps. Starting again with the Roman era, you see here the Rhine as the division between uh, the, oh, the colors are not uh, very uh, clear, but on the top is nice orange on my screen and yellow on the bottom. But you see the limes, the, the line that this is the Rhine, south of which the Romans more or less stopped. And they had cross Rhine contacts, of course, but they did not incorporate north of the Rhine into their realm. When the Romans withdrew, the collapse of the Roman Empire, then uh, Frisians were uh, taken with them as slaves. We know that this happened. Also, Frisians migrated across the North Sea to Anglo-Saxon England, uh, and there will have been minor isolated remnants of the Frisians, uh, Frisians who stayed behind. So you can see how that uh, leads to an inhabitation gap. And then when there's nobody there, new people can come in. So the Saxons probably, we think it was uh, from Saxony, uh, there came new tribes uh, uh, flowing in into this uh, coastal area. Okay, so we have some Anglo-Frisian parallels. They are, they are quite obvious. I will just mention them because they have to do with the story of the Frisians and the, and the parallels with the, with the Anglo-Saxons. So these Anglo-Frisian parallels, uh, they include palatalization. So you say church, we say tscherke, with the tsch sound in common, uh, whereas Germans would say kirche, and Dutch people would say kerk, with a k. Cheese and cheese versus käse and kaas. Another one is fronting of West Germanic A to long E. Eh. I couldn't get a line over that one. Um, also in street versus striete in, Fri in Frisian and straat, straße in, uh, in uh, continental West Germanic. Sheep and skeep, schafe of schaaf and schaap. And deed, die in Frisian versus daad and taat in the continental West Germanic languages. So you see again the, the, the parallels. Also, on a lexeme level, we have them. A key is a kai in Frisian, uh, and the word for holiday in, all, in uh, medieval English, I'll give it a try, halig day. Is that anything? Yeah, okay, okay. I see somebody nodding, thank you. Uh, and yeldagen is what it would be in uh, modern Frisian as a plural. 
So you see the, the parallel there as well. And then there are the Anglo-Frisian <coughs> runes. The runes found in England and the runes found in the Frisian coastal areas, they come from the same alphabet, the Futh Ark, as an innovation of the Futh Ark. So that's why in Frisian studies we use the tagline, the Frisian is really the first cousin of Old English. It's very close. Um, but still, we can, we can say this, but how exactly has this gone about? Um, this is what we call the Anglo-Frisian complex, because we do not know exactly what happened. We know that they were on the mainland a neighbor, so they have similar Inguianic dialects. Um, we know that they were co-colonizers with the migration over the North Sea, Frisians came with them, and also perhaps Anglo-Saxons who did not cross stayed behind, just so you can see where parallels may emerge from that. Uh, and there's the possibility of Inguianic retention on the British Isles as well as on the Frisian mainland. So that would be kind of a coincidence, but of course that might have happened. And the most probable thing is that it is a mix of all of these and perhaps even other factors we have not yet thought of. But the parallels are there. It's uh, up to us to try to solve why are they there. And that's, a, that's an intriguing uh, puzzle. Okay. Um, the era of the kings, uh, so the early medieval times. The char characteristics of the Frisians, of the speakers of the Frisian language, is that they are heathens, that they uh, live on turps, quite, quite typically. They are man-made dwelling mounds, so when the sea comes rolling in twice a day, uh, they are safe and they can live on their, on their mounds, uh, so they stay dry and, uh, and alive. Um, also very typical is the trade. The Frisians were very strong traders. The, the word Frisian at some point is almost equal to the word uh, uh, tradesman. Dorestad is very much uh, the, the predecessor of the Rotterdam Harbor or the Antwerpen Harbor. Uh, in the Rhine estuary, every trade went through Dorestad and everything was brought up the Rhine via Dorestad and onto the North Sea and everywhere also via Dorestad. It was a, uh, an absolute economic center of Western Europe. Also, a lot of skiatas were traded there. You have them, of course, here in England, but we have a lot of skiatas in the Frisian uh, mainlands in, uh, in archaeological, archaeological finds as well. So another tagline is that Magna Frisia, you see the, the word Greater Frisia, ran from Bruges to Bremen. So all along the North Sea coast uh, was at one time a Frisian area, a Frisian-speaking area. Not very far inland, but most definitely along the coast. And the North Sea was, uh, at least at several, in several instances, indicated as the Mare Frisicum, the Sea of the Frisians. This goes to show that the Frisians were a prominent North Sea culture in the time, at the time. Th so then comes the Comital area, and what does that do uh, geographically wise? We see the Franco-Frisian Wars, which I mentioned when the Franks come north over the Rhine and uh, push back the Frisians which was in the 7th, 8th, 9th century. Uh, characteristically also is the missionaries. So when the Franks become more inf inf uh, be be get more influence than the, uh, the, the missionaries uh, start, so Willibrod and Boniface come over to uh, Friesland and Christianize the Frisians. Also typical is the Viking rage, which of course you know everything about here, but we've had our share as well. Being such a rich and successful trading people, the Vikings really know, knew uh, where, to, uh, where to go. Um, and meanwhile, quite interestingly, the settlement of North Frisia takes place. So in two waves, in the 8th, 8th century and in the 11th century, the Frisians uh, colonize North Friesland. Um, one can imagine because of the Viking raids, perhaps, or because of the Christianization that they did not want to, uh, be Christianized, there must have been push and pull factors and, uh, well, uh, those might be a few of them. So North Frisia has its own development for over 1,000 years and in some cases over 12 or 1,300 years, its own linguistic development, rendering a language, a Frisian dialect, which is to me completely incompre incomprehensible. I've worked in Kiel for four years. Kiel is where the North Frisian studies are conducted. And after four years, I still had very much trouble understanding my North Frisian uh, fellow Frisian speaker. So it's, it's had complete different influence and it has rendered a completely different Frisian language. So then comes the era of Frisian freedom. 
from 1100 to 1500, Dutch presses northward from uh, the 10th century onwards, so the, the western part of the Netherlands is Dutchified, one could say. Low German presses on the north and the west, uh, 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 presses northward and westward, so in the east of the, of the area from about the 14th century onwards. And there's additional high German pressure from about the 15th century onwards, all of them rendering a smaller linguistic area for the Frisian language. As a result, we have no written Old Frisian from the South uh, Frisian area, as I explained. But we do have, and this is, this is very nice, we have many Middle Low German translations. So this, this Frisian law, uh, they needed the law even though the language shift took place. Of course, they could not adopt a new law system. <coughs> so what they did, they translated their Old Frisian laws into Middle Low German laws. And luckily they did so because many manuscripts were destroyed in the course of time. Um, but we have Middle Low German translations. I think about 200 of them in total. There are, there are very many. Uh, Johanneke is, 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 a, is an expert on that. And many of these manuscripts contain copies of Old Frisian law texts, which we do not have anymore in original. So we only have the translations which allow us to study Old Frisian law via the translation. So that's, that's really, really important stuff. Okay, just a little side note is what would have happened if the Frisians won a battle, a battle or two instead of lost everything. <laughs> then the Frisian language area may have looked like this. This is just something I found on the internet and I just wanted to show here, especially, of course, because a little piece called Noordwijk, which you would call Norwich, I think, might have been Frisian after all if things had gone, gone differently. Okay, please forget this slide. It's just a little, little side note. So, written Old Frisian is from the era of the Frisian independence, from, the 11th, uh, from 1100 till about 1550, uh, uh, halfway up the 16th century. And there are major dialect areas, I will just mention them once again, the South Old Frisian area with no written records in the west of the, of the Netherlands. Then we have v uh, West Old Frisian in German, that would be West, um, uh, Alt West Friesisch, East Old Frisian, Alt Ost Friesisch, and North Old Frisian, of which also no Old Frisian is uh, uh, handed down to us. Now, quite, quite confusingly, I will mention it, and please forget it so you don't get confused, is that in, in, in Dutch uh, uh, linguistics, you would call South Frisian West Fries. So West Frisian. So that's why there's West Friesland on the map. You see it over there. Please forget it. This, this is the South Frisian language area, and West Fries, Frisian is from the striped area where it says Alt West Friesisch. So, just taking a look how um, how uh, how well you are paying attention. Okay, thank you so much. We will go on. What is Old Frisian? So, what do we have nowadays? Not so much, but not so little. It starts in the 12th century with small psalm fragments. We have uh, a few uh, uh, parchment fragments containing Frisian psalms, teaching us, you know, uh, indicating that Latin and Frisian were, uh, were uh, that, that Frisian was used to learn Latin. We know that from from the from the parchment fragments. Then, from about the end of the 13th century onwards, the old old Frisian writing tradition really uh, uh, becomes fluent. There's a, there's a stream of manuscripts of which we now have only 17 left, more or less large manuscripts. So it's not, it's not too uh, little a corpus, but it's most definitely not a large corpus. Also we have from the 14th century up until the 16th century, and all from the West Frisian language area, charters, about 1,100 of them. And they're very nice because they tell you everything about everyday life, where law stipulations tell, tell you what life should be like, Charters tell you what life is actually like. So they descript, uh, describe instead of prescribe. All of this, virtually 100% of everything we have in Old Frisian is law. It's legal text. And in the manuscripts, not so much in the charters, but in the manuscripts, you see the strong ideological freedom background. Every time they speak about how the free Frisians should have this or should have that or should do this or should do that, the tagline free Frisian is everywhere in the corpus. So they really wanted to express this to the outside world and to themselves. 
As I said, they were not translated from Latin. Uh, they were initially uh, uh, written down in Frisian and copied, and only later uh, Latin, some Latin translation emerged. It was initially oral law, as I said, and from the 11th century onwards, they put it in writing. And after 1500, the writing, the writing language in uh, the Frisian areas becomes either Dutch or Middle Old German. The, the Frisian writing tradition more or less comes to a stop. In the map, you see with some, um, uh, uh, with, with some circles the manuscripts that have survived and where they are situated, where, they, uh, where we think they came from. Please ignore the, the, the abbreviations, but uh, you can see that, uh, well, the, the area they are there from uh, in, in, modern, in a modern day map. Okay, so what do we have? We have 17 law manuscripts, either from the east or from the west, which is important because the east and the west constitute the main dialects of Old Frisian, Old East Frisian and Old West Frisian. About half of it comes from the east, those are the older ones. I will not go through them all because that's just tedious, but uh, you can see that the red, uh, the red manuscripts, the red abbreviations are older than the, than the blue ones uh, at the bottom. So we don't know why, but it's, it's quite striking that the older ones from the east, uh, that the manuscripts from the east should be older than the ones from the west. Then there must be an explanation for that. It, can, it cannot be coincidence. These manuscripts uh, have text blocks which are quite often present in several manuscripts. So there were central core uh, blocks of old Frisian law, which were so important that they were pan-Frisian. They were used all over the Frisian area and therefore copied into manuscripts from all over the Frisian area. And a very important one is the, is the, uh, the 17 statutes and the 24 land laws. They, they were all over in use, all over in Frisland, they were in use. So they were copied everywhere, with small regional uh, uh, variations, of course, but the backbone is, is there. And the same holds for the compensation tariffs. So if I chop off your hand, I should pay 10 pounds, and then we can go on with our lives, Think, things like that, which I think you have in Anglo-Saxon text as well, right, the, 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 the compensation registers. Then, of course, there are regional law texts pertaining only to a certain uh, region or locality within the Frisian area, very important within Old Frisian law is inheritance law. They were very committed to keeping the estates together, to not have estates be divided and scattered all over. So law, uh, inheritance law was paramount. Also very important is clerical law, where the Frisians were uh, rabid heathens at first. They were model Christians afterwards. That's also how they showed themselves in the Old Frisian laws. We are perfect Christians. So clerical law is very important in Old Frisian law as well. It's very old, it's from the 8th or the 9th or the 10th century in the manuscript, so the synodal laws are very interesting. And also very interesting is their process law. How did they conduct their legal procedures? The Frisians wrote that down quite, quite uh, um, uh, detailed. So to get a glimpse of what old Germanic law was conducted, you can take a very good look at, uh, at the old Frisian uh, laws and that, that, that will help you get insight into that. Okay, so now I've been talking about everything uh, about Old Frisian, but it's about time that you hear some Old Frisian, right? Um, so what you see here is a picture from the first Hunzingo manuscript, which is in the more or less central area of the, of the Frisian uh, uh, language. It is East Old Frisian. It's from the 14th century, this manuscript that is, and it's the ninth of the 17 statutes, which in origin go back to the first millennium, the end of the first millennium. Okay, so I will read it out loud, and you can either read the manuscript or, or try to, or, or read with the, with the trans, uh, transcription, whatever you like. Die aasterste lonstrete is up to Hamburg en Uto Gevere, die middelste up to Mimiger de Vorda en Uto Emeza, die thredde up to Kovorda en Uto Stavere. Aak jef vrezen na kaapmen an dier as zogen streten na enig ber de benert, jef de biravet werde as Saxen en Merkem oor jocht, so Skelmet him fella, and then comes what it costs. I'll translate. The easternmost land street is up to Hamburg and down to Jever. The middle one is up to Münster and down to Emden. And the third one is up to Kuforden and down to Staven. So those are all towns in the vicinity or in Frise, uh, Friesland. <coughs> also, if Frisian merchants on any of these seven streets are attacked, or are unlawfully robbed in Saxon territories, then one must impose a fine for this on him, the attacker, and then comes how much it costs. 
So you have heard three land streets and also that there were seven streets and the other four were the rivers Rhine, Ems, Elbe, Weser. Those constitute the seven streets in which free Frisians were free to travel and trade, indicating once again that they had their own law, their own legal position, that they could not be uh, judged uh, with, uh, with a different law. They had their own law. So much like Roman citizens, one could say, once you're a Roman, then you're, then you're safe, then you were privileged. So this is what it, what it expresses. Also, just to show you that Old Frisian had its dialects and that the fact that we have different uh, text blocks in manuscripts that are quite similar, it allows you to <coughs> compare texts within time and uh, within several stages of time and within several dialects. If you have the same text in 10 manuscripts, then you can imagine that the comparison will teach you a lot. So I have here a little, a little uh, introduction into, uh, into Frisian law uh, called the prologue. Uh, the top one is from the Rustering dialect, which is easternmost at the, the, the borders of the Weser. Then we have the middle one, which is from the central area uh, uh, of uh, also old East Frisian, but much more in the center of the Frisian area. And the bottom one is from the southwestern co uh, uh, corner of the, of the Frisian language area. And I'll read the middle one, and then you can, well, you you can see where I've indicated some differences and some similarities in the, in the pictures. The middle one says, Here is geschrieven that we all zullen gelond rucht halden, so God selva heerst zet aan baat. That we alle rucht thing and alle after thing helden, al so long as we leverde. So here it is written that we should hold such land law as God himself first imposed and commanded. That we should hold all, all lawful things and all true things for as long as we should live. So again, here is a uh, connection between God, be between Christianity and law. We are perfect Christians. That's why our law, coming from God himself, is the best law. Don't mess with us. Um, this is the, the map where the, where the old Fr just uh, you saw this map before, but this is where you can see the, the manuscripts deriving. The bottom one is from the, uh, it's from the, left, uh, the left down corner. The middle one, H2, is from where it says, uh, uh, the, the, uh, well, from the, from the middle, with, with the A of alt Ostfriesisch, And the top one, R1, is from the easternmost part up on the borders of the Rhine. So, there you have it. How can you study Old Frisian? What, what, what ways do you have to study Old Frisian? This is the holy trinity of philology. We have grammars, we have dictionaries and we have editions. So Grammar's very important one is uh, Rolf Bremer's introduction to Old Frisian. I'll, I will pick it up and go out of the screen. That's this one, just holding it up for the camera, but also for you. It's a very good uh, introduction into, uh, into Old Frisian, a very good grammar, more or less modeled after Alistair Campbell's uh, Old English grammar. Um, it's the best we have. We have several, but they're older and they're not nearly as good as this one. Um, then we have dictionaries. Uh, Johannek has already held up the Altfriesische Handwörterbuch, which is the most recent one, but we also have older dictionaries, which are probably easier to get and perhaps a bit cheaper. Unfortunately, we do not have English dictionaries yet, so there lies a good task for perhaps some uh, clever Oxfordians uh, eager on Old Frisian. Um, and we have editions. They're on there too, on the table, uh, examples of it. Uh, first up, perhaps you could pick up the Rustering Handschrift. The, the, yes, that one. The, those are diplomatic editions of most uh, Old Frisian uh, uh, texts, and they're for linguists. So they render the, the manuscript as it is. They're diplomatic. And the other one by um, Buman Abel, uh, they're critical, so they're for historians. They've been normalized, and they contain German translations. <laughs> And these are all of the manuscripts. They're not of the charters. We have editions of the charters, but they're not translated. And very important is uh, the Friesische Rechtsquellen by Karl von Richthofen. Johanneke has held up a Tolkien's a copy of a, of a dictionary. The dictionary accompanied a text edition by the same uh, author, a monumental and a, a truly brilliant book in which he as a law, he's, he is a law, uh, a legal historian. He's interested in law rather than in language, and he uh, uh, he, he, he puts up several 
variations of the same text just to show what legal differences there may be over, over the time and over, uh, over place. Uh, in 1840, and it's, it's absolutely a state of the art at the time and still very much usable, and you can see it on Google Books, so I really recommend uh, uh, if anybody wants to dive into Old Frisian that, that you look up the book on Google Books. Furthermore, we have the Deutsches Rechtswörterbuch, which probably most of you know. It's online. It's also in print, but it's also online. It's a brilliant <coughs> dictionary telling you what legal terms there are in the old Germanic language area, also old Saxon terms, but also old Frisian terms, with context, with anything you want, comparing them and telling you everything about uh, the legal background of, uh, of the words. And since old Frisian is virtually 100% legal texts, you can imagine how important the Deutsches Rechtswörterbuch is for Old Frisian, but also vice versa. The Deutsches Rechtswörterbuch is so keen on uh, reading Old Frisian and uh, taking it into their studies because the Old Frisian texts give you a mirror on Old Germanic law. They, they, uh, they allow you to see farther in time than any other language would. And then there's the Handbuch des Friesischen. Uh, Johanneke, if you would be so kind as to hold it up, uh, Handbook of Frisian Studies, a bilingual, um, um, well, stone, one could say, um, with articles on every, every aspect of Frisian Studies you can think of. If you want to dive into any subject with Old Frisian or with Modern Frisian, this is your first uh, step. See what has been done, uh, state of the art in 2001. But since things in Frisian Studies do not progress with too much uh, 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 rapidity, then uh, you, could, uh, you could use it uh, for, uh, for a stepping stone uh, just the same. It's very good. And partially in English. So now is the question, why should you study Old Frisian? This is the most important question for you, I think. Why should you do that? There are the spheres of influence. You have seen that the Frisians dwell on the North Sea coast and they're exactly between the northern power block of the Scandinavians, of the Vikings, and the Franconian south power block. And uh, it has been described as a pivot point of power blocks. You can see how, how they meet in the Frisian area um, and how the Frisians would trade with them, uh, with the Vikings, just as well <coughs> as they would with the Franconians, as they did. Um, so they're right up there in the center, in the, in the eye of the storm, one could say. Also, the Frisian freedom is very uh, unique. The, politically, the, the Frisian situation is absolutely unique politically in Western and Central Europe. The independence of the Frisians needs your attention. It's, 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 uh, it's absolutely unique. Now, due to the Frisian freedom, as I said, their language is very archaic. There was no need to translate and modernize. There was just no need. They, did not, they copied, but they retained all their archaisms, linguistically as well as content-wise. So you see Old Germanic law as old as it gets. It does not get older than what you see in, uh, in Old Frisian uh, manuscripts. Then there are the Anglo-Frisian similarities, which we've talked about, uh, being the first cousin of Old English. And which, what I find especially alluring to Old Frisian is that it is very small, but it's not too small. So you have a good set of data. If you would do research, you would have enough data just to, to make general statements about language or about <laughs> history. No problem whatsoever. But the language corpus is not so large that you could not take everything into account. If you were really committed, you could take the full Old Frisian corpus into account into any study you would do, which makes it very alluring, I would say. OK. Now, specific interests for English studies would be comparative linguistics. I can imagine settlement history. What is the role of the Frisians in the settlement of the Anglo-Saxon uh, of, of the British Isles? Language contact, because when the Frisians came, they must have been in contact via trade or via settlement with the Anglo-Saxons, and vice versa. The Anglo-Saxon missionaries must have been in contact with the Frisians. So there's also matters of mutual intelligibility, which are very and uh, uh, very, uh, very uh, interesting, I would say, and other things uh, which, yeah, which, which I have not listed here, but I can imagine that there are tons of things you could do in comparing Frisian and English. Uh, for German studies specifically, again, of course, comparative linguistics are in order, but also the language shift from Frisian to Low German is understudied. We do not know what happened there, but it's, 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 it's a unique case, one could say, where you can study with 
very uh, numerous sources how this came about, what happened in the Ostfriesland and in the, the low German, uh, the nowadays low German areas of Germany and uh, where Frisian was once spoken. So that's a nice case, waiting for your attention. Also for German studies, I would say that modern language policy is interesting. If you're into old Germanic, of course, this is not the first thing that comes up, but many of you may find yourself at a later stage in your lives uh, dealing with uh, German language policy. And Zaterfriesisch and North Frisian are minority, minority languages. And I know, because I also work on language policy for modern West Frisian, I know how knowing the history of the languages helps in explaining why they matter, why they need protection and why they need uh, attention from, the, from the, the governments. So that helps as well. Um, I will now read, read a bit of Karl von Richthofen, which I mentioned. I'm, I'm a bit of an admirer of him, and he explained very well in the Vorrede to his uh, text edition what interests him in Old Frisian studies. So we're going back 180 years in time, but I think it still holds. Die Friesen bilden, was Sprache und Recht betrifft, den Übergang zwischen den Bewohnern des Nordens und denen des übrigen Deutschlandes. Auch ihre Wohnsitze erstrecken sich von denen der nordischen Völker längs Sachsen und Franken bis an romanische Gegenden. Dies gewährt ein Hauptinteresse. Ein zweites liegt in dem eigentümlich starren Wesen des Volkes, welches altes C bewahrte. Bear in mind, this is romantic speed, speaking. Um, I'm not that C, I think. Beides verbunden macht das Studium des friesischen Volkslebens für das Verstehen deutscher Geschichte, deutscher meaning Germanic, im umfassendsten Sinne dieses Wortes wichtig. Leider sind uns keine poetischen Denkmäler und nur unbedeutenden Chroniken aus Friesland aufbehalten. Dies erhöht den Wert der Rechtsdenkmäler Frieslands und sie sind in solchem Reichtum vorhanden wie bei keinem anderen deutschen Stamm. Okay, so... He sees the, the appeal. Um, I hope you do too. He was 23 when he wrote this, so your age. Not only Karl von Richthofen say, sees the importance of the Old Frisian text collection, also the UNESCO does, because only last week, 10 manuscripts, six of them in Old Frisian, so a large part of the Old Frisian corpus, was uh, nominated and actually uh, uh, granted a memory of the world status. So we, we're talking about uh, unique world heritage here. This is the Richthofen collection, 10 books owned by the same Karl von Richthofen, which, the, uh, the, which are kept in Tresor and Leeuwarden since 1922. So exactly one century ago, they came to Friesland, back to Friesland, and now one century later, UNESCO has, uh, uh, has given it uh, a memory of the world status, which is absolutely uh, brilliant, of course, for, uh, for, Frisian, for Frisian studies and old Frisian studies. And as Johanneke said, please take a look at www.richthofen.nl where these 10 manuscripts are digitized and you can see all of them for yourselves and also some uh, background on them. Now the ambition with this UNESCO status is also that in, in, in time we would like to create sort of a network of uh, uh, international, uh, an international UNESCO network of European old Frisian manuscripts holding institutes like, for example, Oxford, but also Paris, The Hague, Groningen, Leeuwarden, Hanover, Wolfenbüttel, Oldenburg, Basel, Ghent, they're all over uh, Western Europe. So you can imagine how inspiring it could be if you have all of those institutes surrounded, uh, 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 combined uh, around one corpus of old Frisian uh, manuscripts and studying it from every angle. That would be absolutely brilliant. Now, why in Oxford? Why should you bother with Old Frisian studies in Oxford. There is the Junius connection. Uh, the Dutch Oxfordian, because he was born in Heidelberg but was, uh, went to uh, Holland quite soon, so he's a D Dutch speaker. Uh, Franciscus Junius, one of your most uh, prominent Oxfordians, he studied Old Frisian from a comparative view. Uh, so he made Old Germanic glossaries uh, uh, using Old Frisian to, to compare old, old Germanic languages, and these glossaries are at the Bodleian. They are here. And he owned Old Frisian manuscripts, or at least copies of them, which are also here at the Bodleian. So there are Uniana showing you how much he was committed to studying Old Frisian uh, material. Also, he was in close contact with Frisian scholars. He really acknowledged the value of Frisian for comparing Old Germanic. 
He was very, uh, very keen on that. So what I'd like to say is quit liquid, junio liquid us all. I would say what, what's good for junior, jun, juniors should be good for all of us. It's probably bad Latin, but um, bear with me. Okay, the most important reason perhaps why you should study altruism is because it's just so beautiful. So I would, it may be legal but it, and it may be prose, but it does not mean that prose cannot be poetic as well. And what I would like to do is just read out a bit of uh, uh, Old Frisian to you, which in my opinion is the most beautiful part of Old Frisian law there is. And I would challenge you to uh, send me a piece of Old Germanic law which is more poetic than what you're about to hear. I will read out the, the right upper part and you can e either read the German translation or try to follow in the manuscript. It starts at the third line, Dio uh, Trede. I think you will see the words over there. Okay. Dio Trede neet is, wanneer dat kind is alle stok naak en jefte hoeslaas, en de dan de tjustere nieuwelnacht en die troegkalde winter toekomt, zo vaart al er mannek ons in hoof en in zijn hoes en de onwarme gaten, en dat beer wil dit jaar zeker des bergers glie in den holle baan, al deer het dat lief om behalve. Zo so weinat en de skriat dat onjerige kind en de wiept dan zijn naken de leda en de zijn hoeslaas en de zijn vader, die hem redder schuld, jens den honger en den een kalde nieuwel winter. Dat hij zo jaap en de zo dimme, maar dat fjoer nijlem is onder eken en onder molda besletten en betacht. Zo so moot je moeder des kindes eer was zet aan de cella, omdat je pleiende plicht aag, al zo lange als het onjerig is, dat het onvroosten en een hongere oervaren. So you can hear the rhythm, you can hear the alliteration, you can hear the poetry in this, uh, in this text. This, this has been dubbed legal poetry uh, in the past. And well, uh, as I said, uh, I, I would really like uh, any, any one of you to send me a piece of legal prose that's more poetic than, than this one. Then to close the old Frisian summer school, or were you planning on uh, speaking on it yourself, Johanneke? No? Okay. So, uh, Johanneke uh, came up with the idea and asked me to join her, in, uh, so we were co-initiating and co-organizing uh, Oxford University and Groningen uh, University. We came up with the plan in 2018, um, and we have now a biannual one-week immersion into Old Frisian. This is what the summer school is, an immersion into Old Frisian. Uh, you will do translation workshops if you would enter. You would le learn all about grammar and about methods of Old Frisian studies and how to compare it with older uh, Old Germanic languages. You would have manuscript viewings, of course, social events and networking, uh, but also quite important to us is the exchange of le lecturers that Oxfordians can come over to Holland and Dutch teachers can come over here to teach. And it's hybrid, so it's online as well as on campus. Uh, we did the first one in 2019, and two years later, mid-COVID, we did an online version in Groningen. <coughs> and that's why we do it hybrid now, because we learned that uh, doing it online has its uh, advantages, uh, most definitely. But meeting each other is so important, so uh, that's why we uh, go hybrid. 2023, we will do it in Oxford in June, uh, 9 until the 16th of, uh, sorry, July. July, yes. Uh, and two years later, in 2025, uh, it would be in Groningen. And uh, yeah, it would be brilliant to see you all twice or thrice because I'm seeing you now as well. So this is why, in my humble opinion, Old Frisian really is a hidden gem of Old Germanic studies and it's uh, for you to pick it. Thank you.